You guys have me on audio still? Yep. Good, okay. I have more elaborate equipment, but I'm using the built-in for now. It seems to be working. <clears throat> All right, well, I think we might as well get started. Uh, and we're going to open the night with a uh, pre recorded welcome from Michael Foyt, the Director of Distinctive Collections at Villanova. If you can uh, roll that tape. <laughs> Love it. Or not, you know. <laughs> Gotta love Zoom. We start every evening with minor technical difficulties, but it, it rapidly <laughs> improves. All right, here we go. I hope. Let me welcome you to the second day of Papers for the People, a Don Novel Symposium. This symposium is supported by a digitizing hidden collections grant from CLEAR, which is also made possible from funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I'm Michael Foyt, Director of Distinctive Collections and Digital Engagement at Villanova University's Falvey Memorial Library. First, I'd like to thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and to CLEAR for their support to both digitize and describe materials published by the Beadle and Adams firm, as well as for this very symposium. Next, let me thank all of the members of the team at Villanova who continue to work so very hard to preserve and describe the Don novel and more broadly, popular literature. From housing to digitization, these materials are often at risk, highly fragile, and not well described. And so there's a host of challenges to overcome to provide access. Baudry Allen, preservation and digital archivist, Laura Bang and Rebecca Oviedo, librarian archivists, and of course, Damian Katz, director of technology development. Our digital library enterprise is based on digi digitizing materials, both from our own distinctive collections, as well as from a host of institutional digital partners and individual digital donors. Digitization is done freely by Villanova at our in-house digitization lab. These materials are scanned and physical copies are then returned to the owners. While Villanova maintains a perpetual digital copy under a Creative Commons license. And thus, these rare materials are made freely available to a global public in the service of scholarship and all for the greater good. Without support from our university librarian, Millicent Gaskell, our provost, Pat Majitti, and Father Peter Donahue, this service wouldn't be possible. And so I'm very grateful for their continued support in making this rare literature available to a global community. Villanova's popular collections have been grown both from physical and digital donations from a group of generous scholars and donors. And in particular, I'd like to reach out and thank some of those individuals, including Lydia Sherman, D.D. Johnson, the family of Edward T. LeBlanc, and Joseph Renault. You've donated very generously to our collections, and we hope that we have uh, shared those with, with others. Um, and not just house them in our physical collections behind locked doors. And of course, if you have collections that you might consider sharing with others, please reach out to me and we can discuss uh, a digital donation uh, or a physical donation. Of course, this is the celebration of the completion of the Beetle and Adams digitization done in collaboration. But it is also a preview of the next step, which is digitization at the other end of the timeline, not from the beginning of the Don Memorial, such as Arthur Westbrook of Ohio, 
or those who publish globally uh, and tackling the international dime novel and serial literatures. So this is an ongoing effort. Besides just the digitization efforts at dimenovels.org, we aim to create the most extensive bibliography of popular literature and volunteers are most welcome to assist us in this enterprise. We have a spirit of experimentation at Villanova as well, including reading entire dime novels, reforming, reformatting them um, with distributed proofreaders um, to make them available um, via Project Gutenberg. Um, we work with commercial uh, publishers as well to provide no cost uh, preservation images for, for publications as well. And so um, I, I think having in a, a spirit similar to that that collaborated also online, uh, looking at the collections that have been digitized and, um, and, and getting more value and reading these uh, really, really incredible uh, uh, survivals uh, from another era. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you, Michael, from uh, two days ago. And uh, now we're going to move on to a, a brief discussion of some ways of uh, participating in the dime novel uh, scholarly community. And we're going to start that uh, with a few words from Marlena Brumseth, the current editor of Dime Novel Roundup. Uh, and Matt, can we get our slide back? Can you see that now? Yeah. Yes, indeed. We just right, need good. the next slide. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Marlena Bramseff, the editor of Dime Novel Roundup. I've been the editor since December of 2012. I am the first female editor of a long reign of males, which is kind of cool. Um, a Dime Novel Roundup, which has been around since 1931. So as I said last night, this is our 89th year of, pub of continuous publication. It started out as a four page uh, little leaflet pamphlet as it may. And now it is, in, it is a full blown anywhere from 40 to 48 uh, page journal. We publish articles about any aspect of the areas of dime novels uh, between 1860 and 1915 story papers between 1839 and 1924, juvenile series books between 1850 and 1945, and pulp magazines between 1896 and 1950. Uh, we like scholarly articles, reports of significant research. We have a column called Dime Novelties. If you run across something interesting about a dime novel that you want to report, usually one to two pages long. Um, if you are looking at submitting a longer article, it needs to be no longer than 10 type pages in length, although we will consider longer ones. Um, we have a review committee that looks at them. So if you submit a dime, no, you know, a article, not dime novel, but an article to us, don't expect it to be immediately um, published. It may take some time because the uh, magazine is only published quarterly, which is a spring, summer, fall, and winter issues. So um, we, you know, he has here all my contact information. If anybody wants further information about submitting, uh, I do have a guideline for uh, submission, which I can certainly send to you. So you can email me at dimenovelroundup at aol.com. And of course, my mailing address is also here up on the screen. So, you know, I look forward to, you know, hearing from those of you who are interested in helping us to continue this wonderful um, field of scholarship. Uh, it's just great. And I'm very proud to be a very big part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So then if we can move on to the next slide, uh, I guess I, I should introduce myself. I haven't done that tonight. Uh, I am Damien Katz from Villanova University. Uh, and among other hats, uh, I am one of the two co-chairs of the uh, children's and young adult series books and dime novels section of the Popular Culture Association, uh, along with uh, Matt Short, who is also uh, hosting tonight. Uh, and so it seemed appropriate to uh, give a little pitch for PCA. Uh, the National PCA Conference uh, moves around every year. Uh, next year, it's going to be in Boston. Uh, and it is a, a wonderful opportunity to meet uh, like-minded scholars in, in all areas of popular culture. Uh, and of course, tonight we're, we're particularly featuring the, the dime novel related area that, uh, that we host where 
you would potentially have the opportunity to meet uh, in person uh, many of the people who are here tonight. Though, of course, uh, under current circumstances, I don't know how in person that's going to be. Uh, but uh, under normal circumstances, it is, it is a wonderful opportunity to, to share ideas and, and learn a great deal. Uh, so I cannot uh, emphasize enough, if you're enjoying what we're doing here, uh, definitely seek out uh, a future PCA conference. Uh, and if you're interested in presenting, uh, you can always uh, submit through the, the website at the URL here. Um, just like Dime Novel Roundup, our PCA area uh, covers both dime novels and the later juvenile series books that are sort of one of the offshoots. Uh, and we accept a diversity of approaches to these topics, whether it be studying authors, publishers, characters, looking at thematic things, book history things, uh, social issues, and on and on. Uh, the, the possibilities are endless and the slate of papers is always interesting. Uh, so, as I say, please consider joining us, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Matt and me, and we'll be happy to fill you in further. Uh, and also, while we're talking about uh, places to participate, uh, I wanted to take an impromptu opportunity uh, to welcome Bob Sipes from the Horatio Alger Society, who happened to join us tonight, and who I thought might be interested in saying a few words about that organization uh, and their uh, publication, Newsboy. Thank you, Damien. And this definitely is not prepared, so just take it for what it is. Um, some, many of you on here I've met, or I know or I've met online in some fashion, uh, but I've, I've been involved with the Horatio Alger Society for, I don't know, close to 20 years now. It's been around since 1961. Um, it is much more than just dedicated to the Horatio Alger and his books and studies around his books. It's what it started out as it has broadened into that. And if any of you are familiar with Newsboy, then you'll know that we do uh, publish articles on just about every area of dime novels, um, series books, both boys and girls, and anything related and in between there from primarily the, the you know, last half of the 19th century and then the early 20th century. We don't get too much into the more modern stuff, um, but there's a lot of good information out there. I don't, I'll put a link out there to our Newsboy uh, site. We have a, a Rachel Alger site and we actually have PDFs of all of the Newsboys out there up and up to the last uh, we keep the last couple of years uh, not out there, and then we slowly put those out there as we move forward. Um, but we're open for publishers. I mean, if you want to publish an article, we're open for anything related to uh, dime novels or basically, you know, children's literature from that time period. And uh, we try, you know, we're not really looking to compete with Dime Novel Roundup. It has its own area. Many of Many of our members also subscribe to Dime Novel Roundup and, and publish in both. So definitely we're out there. There's a lot of good information. But I know, I believe Matt, Matt, Matthew wrote a recent article. It was published in Newsboy. It was very good. And uh, we had some good comments regarding that. Well, thank you, Bob, for the, the impromptu pitch. And definitely please drop some URLs in the chat so people can follow up uh, if they're interested. All right, and uh, with that, I believe we can move on to our first of two panels. Uh, but before we begin, I just wanted to say a few words about how this is going to work. Uh, we have a lot of participants. We had a few people speaking yesterday and we have two additional panels tonight. So in each panel, we're going to focus on a few specific people to make sure everyone has an opportunity to participate. But certainly if, if you're on a different panel and you have something to say, you're welcome to raise your hand and we will try to fit you in. Um, and for everyone who's not a panelist, uh, you can ask questions in the chat as they come up or you can raise your hand, but we're going to answer questions and uh, talk to audience members in the Q&A at the end, just to be sure we have enough time to get through all of the panel discussions. So 
like I say, ask away, but please be patient and we'll, we'll talk some more at the end. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get on to our first panel discussion uh, in which we are going to talk about genre. And as we did yesterday, I'm going to start with a, a very open-ended question that I'm going to let the panelists answer in alphabetical order by last name so they all have opportunities to introduce themselves and say a little bit about their interests. And then we will go from there and see how this evolves. Uh, and if you don't mind, Matt, maybe stop sharing the slides so that we can see everybody a little bit better. So uh, first question is, can you introduce yourself and tell us more about the genre you have been most interested in, uh, in dime novel land. Uh, and I believe we will start with Christine Bold. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, you're coming through very clearly. Okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much indeed for the invitation. It's really phenomenal to have learned about um, where you and Sata and uh, Matt and others have got with this project. So huge congratulations. I'm Christine Bold, um, Professor of English at the University of Guelph, which resides on the territories and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit in what is now called Canada. Um, I first came to Dime Novels uh, over four decades ago I was a graduate student at the University of London in England, working on a PhD dissertation um, on the history of popular Westerns. And um, I remember very vividly sitting working in what was then the British Museum Library, turning the pages of Johansson's um, volumes, calling up down novels, trying to get copies of what I think was then called Reckless Ralph's Dime Novel Roundup, if that's right. So that's where it began for me. And at that point, I was trained as a literary studies scholar. And so I was actually doing close readings of Dime Novel Westerns and learning a lot about um, ways in which authors' voices wrote the conditions of their production, the conditions of the publishing industry into their Dime Novel Westerns. Quite a few years later, I returned and did a much more um, embedded cultural history of how the popular image of the American West was kind of seized for exclusive white male interests at the turn of the 20th century. And at that point, the dime novels, the dime novel westerns were very interesting to me for the ways in which they both participated in and resisted that kind of um, representation of a whitened, quote unquote, American West. And now, right now, um, the project I'm working on now is to contribute to the recovery of popular indigenous or Native American popular indigenous performers from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And in the midst of doing this work, hey presto, there's a dime series by Prentice Ingram, which appropriates one of these performers, a popular Seneca performer called Gawango Mohawk. And so, I've come, so having this opportunity to um, write a spotlight on that mini series and um, think more about how dime novel Westerns participate in the world of popular theater has been fabulous. So for me to see this journey and you've um, accomplished so much Thank you very much and just huge congratulations. Thank you very much. So I think uh, Matthew Kearns is next. Hey, I'm uh, Matt Kearns. I'm a, a, an author and historian from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, I actually uh, have a book coming out about Texas Jack Omohundro, who was um, uh, both a, the earliest kind of cowboy to star on stage. He was Buffalo Bill's uh, first stage partner and best friend, um, but also the star of dime novels. He and Buffalo Bill both kind of uh, made their start as uh, dime novel characters in Ned Buntline's early uh, Western stories um, before kind of uh, uh, branching out into acting. Uh, but even after they were 
were actors, they both maintained a, a series of dime novels uh, dedicated to them. I uh, was at a, a, a Buffalo Bill Centennial Symposium where I heard uh, uh, Christine speak on, what was it, Buffalo Bill and dime novelitis, um, which kind of informed the way I looked at uh, Texas Jack's um, kind of a, Texas Jack is a transitional character in dime novels. He's a, he was, uh, he had been a cowboy in Texas before becoming a uh, army scout in Nebraska. And so in the early dime novels, he is a scout and that is his role. Uh, but he is um, described as and portrayed in all the ways that we would uh, believe to typify the cowboy. Uh, so as those stories transition from stories of scouts uh, which were in many ways just uh, moving um, James Fenimore Cooper stories uh, geographically west in, in terms of the tropes that they followed. But as they kind of morphed into their own genre, um, Texas Jack goes from being a scout to being the earliest kind of cowboy in, uh, in uh, popular fiction. Um, so that that's kind of uh, has been my approach to, to uh, dime novels is having done the research on uh, the, the actual historical figure of Texas Jack, of kind of uh, seeing the way, ways that that is juxtaposed with his fictional character, because in many ways, Texas Jack and Buffalo Bill were both uh, real men and uh, um, larger than life folk heroes uh, at the same time as they were the first reality stars. So that's, that is the uh, basis of my research. Thank you very much. And so then, uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Mark Van Wijnen. Hey, I'm Mark Van Wijnen, and I am professor of English at Northern Illinois University. And uh, my past uh, research includes work on American culture and literature of the First World War, especially with an interest of, in poetry. And also I have uh, done work on the history of socialism as expressed in American literature of the 19th century and the 20th century. Um, in a way then I, I come at this um, uh, work in dime novels, um, the subject of dime novels, uh, having been immersed in, in other fields um, uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, in some ways, I, I think that um, my interest in dime novels is, is developed partly opportunistically with the, the excellent um, collection at Northern Illinois University. And um, before uh, becoming acquainted with the, the, the great nickels and dimes um, archive, which is growing through the digitization process, had the pleasure of uh, handling many of the, the originals, um, which I, I know, I, given the level of expertise um, in this group is a pleasure that is shared by others um, in this, this assembly as well. Now my recent and, and current research though is on American literature and culture um, as it relates to the railroad. And um, it's this that brings me sort of centrally to thinking about dime novels as a component of that, that project. So um, with respect to this question of genre that we're talking about tonight, I'm of course interested in railroad fiction, which um, Matt Short identified at last night's session as definitely a recognizable um, group of, of uh, texts in dime and nickel fiction, although it's not really um, a thing now um, so much. And um, so I, I'm interested in, in, first of all, defining it as its core as um, a genre that features work on the railroad, um, especially as it's experienced by engineers, firemen, conductors, and other train operators, such as uh, telegraph um, operators. Um, and that's the central criterion, work on the railroad. But because this fiction has so many different variants and opportunities for plot commute complication, uh, equipment malfunction and various trouble on the line, um, jealous and vindictive co-workers, uh, that's a universal theme, right? Um, train robbers often requiring detective work to apprehend them, 
opportunities to impress the boss and become rich, and then also romantic subplots quite often featuring the attractive daughter of the railroad president. So this sort of proliferation of themes really then connects to a variety of different genres. And in fact, my own interest really is not so much only on the category of railroad dime literature, um, but, but also the railroad generally in all kinds of different genres. And so for that, um, there are depictions, significant depictions of the railroad in many, if not virtually all of the primary uh, subgenres of um, dime novel literature. So it, it verges into detective fiction and romantic melodrama and the Western certainly science fiction um, labor fiction and Horatio Alger type tales of financial success. So even as I'm interested in this particular subset of dime novels that might be called railroad fiction, my, my interest on the railroad actually connects to all kinds of other uh, variants of um, the, the topic of genres and subgenres within the cheap literature. Thank you. So I, I think as, as contemporary readers, we all have a pretty strong idea of what genre is and what the, the current genres are. Uh, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how the stories published in dime novels and story papers conform to those contemporary conceptions of genre and in which ways they diverge. I can uh, kind of step in first because uh, I'm very interested to hear what the other panelists have to say. But um, I think that in terms of, of Westerns, one of the things that I find most interesting is that, uh, you know, the, the, the format of Westerns becomes very standardized and very tropic uh, over time to the point where, you know, if you start a Louis L'Amour book, you essentially know what's going to happen to these characters. Uh, you know, you, you know the plot elements you know the setting. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I mean, not to say there aren't surprises across the genre, because obviously, if there aren't, you don't read it. Um, but for the most part, it feels comfortable. Um, whereas in a lot of the, especially the earliest kind of Western dime novels, um, it's mostly the setting that feels uh, comfortable. Although, um, if we look at like the the earliest, um, especially Buffalo Bill stories. Um, they tend to be stories that are set between Kansas and Nebraska, whereas most Westerns later are going to be either in the Dakotas, uh, in, uh, you know, parts of Texas, or in the southwestern deserts. Uh, so they're a little bit uh, often more Midwestern uh, uh, than we think of Westerns being um, in terms of geography. Uh, but the plots can be pretty wildly divergent. Um, uh, the, the one that I talked about in my uh, spotlight uh, is pretty unique because although it's a fairly standard story of uh, rescuing a wealthy Mexican Don's daughter who's been kidnapped by Comanches, but wait, they're not actually Comanches. It's uh, a, a, a white man who's disguised as a Comanche because uh, the idea of uh, a disingenuous race was very important uh, uh, at that time. Um, a lot of the characters in that story turn out to be, uh, um, you know, a Mexican that's pretending to be a white man, a uh, former Confederate soldier who is disguised as a, a Mexican man, a uh, uh, another white guy who's disguised as a Comanche, and a Mormon who's pretending to be an Irishman. I think is in there too. Um, so you get all of your kind of uh, race mixing and, uh, uh, like I said, disingenuous race characters. Uh, but I say all that to say that uh, what's, what was interesting to me is that um, although the Comanche are portrayed as uh, kind of uh, the savage bad guys, the main character, Texas Jack, the, uh, the heroic cowboy, is given a, uh, a Tonkawa uh, uh, sidekick. Uh, and at some point they go to Texas Jack's ranch where a former slave 
runs the ranch while Texas Jack is away. And Texas Jack trusts this character named Ebony completely. And uh, later in the story, his uh, red snake is his uh, native ally, ends up sacrificing himself uh, to save Texas Jack. And so at the end of the story, he says uh, to his, uh, the former slave that runs his ranch, why don't you come with me and join me for my next set of adventures? So, you know, to imagine that Buffalo Bill Cody uh, is writing this in uh, 1882, publishing it in 1883, uh, is pretty far from what we expect genre-wise. And I think that's the thing that I find uh, draws me to these dime novel stories is that even though you can, you can clearly follow the path of how they became um, the, the kind of tropic fiction we, we expect in our genre stories, um, they also aren't quite so set in stone that they can't be uh, completely different than our expectations at the same time. I'll, I'll just say a few, a few words on this. I, oh, am I jumping in? I guess I've jumped in, so I'm going to jump in with both feet. Um, I'm, I'm struck with um, the questions that, that Matthew and, and Damien have, have put to the, the panel um, really, I think, interestingly play over this, this question of um, historical similarity and difference between the, the dime novels era and our own contemporary um, sense of, of genre. And um, I'm, I'm very tempted to kind of keep thinking about how genres are always in a process of, of formation and that, and that um, some of the questions that, that Damien and Matt have come up with really pushes to think about the ways in which um, certain kinds of genres today are, are very unstable. But, 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 but to speak of the, 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 the period in the 19th century when, um, uh, which is really our focus uh, tonight, um, there, there is so much that is tumultuous and, and uncertain in, in this, this period, and, and it's true of any moment. I mean, who am I to talk about <laughs> more tumultuous times in the past versus in our own present? But, um, but I am struck that, that insofar as there are a lot of social questions that are radically up for grabs in the 19th century, that, um, that, that the genres of the period are really kind of trying to figure out what it is that they want to say in some coherent or consistent way about our society. And my example is as, as, as one of the kind of related genres or subgenres to, to this railroad fiction that is, is sort of my, my bullseye, um, is that labor fiction of this time is, is extremely conflicted about really what it wants for workers. There's a lot of fiction that moves in the direction of being a faithful worker to the railroad and getting rewarded by the president of the railroad by promotion to superintendents and marrying the, and then marrying the superintendent's uh, daughter or some such thing. Very much a kind of social ascent that's very individualistic. But there are other novels that are quite different and, and in their conclusions and in their action um, that, that lean much more in the direction of, of a more a proletarian minded um, perspective and, and, and more collectivist in, in its direction. And, and so that, that tension within those novels, I think, speaks to a certain instability in society and in roles and in objectives of, of, of a class of people, um, workers um, on the railroad or workers in, in other fields that um, I think lends to a kind of generic instability as well. Um, I would just speak a little bit to process as well. I think the thing that um, in my mind is continuous now with genre, I, I obviously agree that in terms of content and even certain thematic patterns, there have been big changes. But in my mind, the constant is the way that genre or maybe formula um, functions in terms of meeting audience expectations, um, working with those expectations, and who, all, who all's interests want into 
that navigation, that kind of cultural navigation. Um, and so that obviously now and then includes marketers, it includes um, any opinion makers of any class or any um, literary category who are trying to shape public opinion and public imagination. Um, it obviously includes many readers who have been charted and then as people were saying last night, many, many categories of readers who defy categorization. So I think for me, it's partly, um, I know John Cowelty wrote about this a really long time ago, but formula and the ability of formula to be kind of moved between convention and invention, for me is about a genre contract so that um, what a reader or an audience expects and what they um, receive is this kind of negotiation where both genre and formula sit. So I'm, I'm going to be, be bold and uh, sort of combine a couple of questions here because uh, I, I want to get an audience, but I also realize that talking about audiences is, is challenging because we don't necessarily have a lot of data there. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about the relationship between genre and audience, uh, both in terms of whether the readers in the dime novel era were aware of genre in anything like the way that contemporary readers are. You know, today people will say, I'm a mystery reader or I'm a science fiction reader. You know, when did that begin to happen? Uh, and on a related note, how did the development of genre and the targeting of audiences play off of each other? And, and you can answer any combination or subset of that that you're comfortable with. <laughs> May I jump in, Damien? Damien, may I jump oh, in? Please. I'm not so sure that there's a, you know, a, a specific time period that, and from my own, um, the genre I study with dime novels is detective fiction because I'm a detective fiction scholar. So I've been working with them for now almost 30 years. And I don't necessarily think that there was ever, you know, a specific, relationship between the readers and the fact, you know, I think people read what they liked, just like you say, they, if they liked a story or if they liked a particular uh, dime novel author who happened to write a certain kind of genre like literature, that's the person that, you know, you know, if they liked Edward Wheeler, they wanted to read his works. If they liked Prentice Ingraham, they wanted to read his works. So I don't think that there was a specific time um, Possibly after the turn of the century, maybe we could say that there was, you know, once some of these genres became a little bit more defined, but, you know, we see, like I see it in the detective fiction realm, for instance, you know, you have a really early dime novels written that featured female detectives. And of course, everybody knows we've got the old sleuth, we've got young sleuth, we've got, you know, uh, uh, all of those types. And then you have uh, indigenous sleuths like Darkie Dan, whom Dan Gorman, you know, wrote about, or, or Sam Johnson, whom I wrote about, who are, you know, African-American sleuths. And you have sleuths of all different uh, types, the urbans, the, you know, those in Westerns. So I'm not so sure that there is a definite answer that can be said to, you know, I, I understand your question, but I don't think that the scholarship that I've seen has not indicated that we can definitively say, oh yeah, in the 1890s, suddenly people recognized genres for what they were and, and, and they ascribed to wanting to read them. Um, I would definitely agree with that. And I think one of the things I find interesting is the representation of audiences as being genre specific, um, because that's a kind of a marketing tool and um, it's a way of classifying and even classing readers. Um, I'm thinking of when the Fred Whitaker piece in 1884-ish, when he was very much resistant to the notion that there were um, niche audiences or pocket audiences and he was also saying that they are, these are very broadly popular and that are, there are many kinds of readers who don't acknowledge that they are dime novel readers. 
So in, in my way of thinking about the historical framework, I would also say that it's kind of after the First World War that there becomes a systematic um, marketing by genre category. That's it. I, I think what I would say to this is just to reinforce um, a phrase um, that, um, that is just used, um, and that is a marketing tool that, that if in some sense um, audience expectation is something that is related to genre, um, I think that audience expectation is in many ways shaped by uh, the ways in which publishers found genres to, uh, as useful ways of marketing and selling, you know, selling the next um, detective story, selling the next Western, selling the next romance or, or what have you. Um, I think the other thing though that is, that is intriguing is that the, the, the publication of, of these titles was of such a volume that there is a kind of feedback loop, which is fairly rapid or relatively rapid um, in terms of the publishers churning out, um, you know, um, many, many titles um, per month um, and, and per year means that they, they had a pretty clear sense of their, had a, a, had their, um, had a clear sense of the pulse of the public and what people were liking and therefore had and then also with the fiction factory and their control over production, they can do a lot of a lot of tweaking in a fairly rapid direction in order to meet what the audience was buying in large larger numbers than other types. And so, in that sense, even if I think it really is very driven by marketing and driven by what publishers um, are finding is selling, the fact that they are are able to to monitor what is selling better and what is selling less well. Um, means that that what you find in terms of the aggregation of certain novels and certain kinds of depictions and representations also in some ways is a kind of reflection of of what the at least the desires of readers were, if not reader identities uh, per se exactly. And I think you know for so many of these stories that were serialized, and so. You know, if you were interested in the Western story that was being serialized, the, the next issue you got may also be the first issue of a detective story. You know, so you weren't just purchasing a single genre uh, in a lot of cases. You were purchasing, if you were purchasing to continue the story that you were already reading, you were getting a second or a third genre uh, included. And if you liked that story, you were going to keep going. And that was kind of the whole point. But I think also that, you know, it's easy to kind of categorize these as, as uh, you know, dime novels, pop fiction, but they weren't just pop fiction, they were pop culture because there wasn't, you know, in today's uh, context, you've got popular fiction, but you also have popular music, popular video games, popular television. And uh, at that era, you didn't have any of that or the majority of that. You had what you were gonna read and that was your entertainment unless you were going to a local play or something that was, uh, you know, localized to where you were. So in terms of broad appeal, this was really essentially it. You had, uh, you know, novels, um, you know, you had Mark Twain, if you're, a, you know, reading an actual novel or Ned Buntline, if you were reading a dime novel, uh, you know, and uh, I think some studies have said that while Twain was the most read figure of his day, Buntline was the second most and Buntline clearly wrote a lot more, uh, had a lot more output than Twain did. Um, but I also think that, that it, you know, because of that, the, the dime novel in, in general, uh, Western genre specifically suffered from a lot of the problems we associate with other forms of pop culture now, like uh, uh, you, you'll see uh, video games tied to violence uh, in the media. Well, there was a case in 1876 where a young serial killer named Jesse Pomeroy uh, in Boston uh, that they said the reason he was, he had killed the, I think, I believe it was a couple of young girls he killed, that the reason he did this was because of dime novels. Uh, in fact, I came across it because there was a quote in a Boston newspaper that said his highest ambition was to be the Texas Jack of South Boston. You know, so you had the same kind of criticisms of popular culture going into dime novels as you do into rap music, video games, 
uh, other kinds of pop cultural phenomenons uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, so to get back to the, the you know, the, the kind of genre question, yeah, I think, you know, I think that there's, there's some definite bleed over, but I think that, uh, you know, in terms of specificity, uh, I don't know, there's just something about these, these stories that really resonated and they resonated in a way that was beyond just genre appeal um, that, uh, you know, people that were Ned Buntline readers would read a story about the California gold rush, uh, about uh, intrigue in New York's, uh, you know, darkest inner city streets and, uh, you know, Western stories about Buffalo Bill, all from the same author uh, without batting an eye. So I think some of, of the past discussion has already anticipated this, but uh, we've talked about how genre was very fluid uh, in the early days of, of dime novels and perhaps became more codified. And, and I think I've heard from several of you that one of the driving forces behind this was publisher marketing plans, but I'm curious whether that's the whole story or if you think there are other factors involved in the eventual greater standardization and uh, separation of genre. Um, I think from coming at it from the Western, I think there were a whole bunch of stories um, that because it was such a vast field of production and in terms of um, working with the mythologization of the American West, it developed such a vast infrastructure of um, sort of ideologies of nationhood. I think that within that, there were all kinds of um, particular um, negotiations and struggles and things that happened around specific events and specific historical figures, some of whom Matthew has already been talking about. Um, one of the moments that I was digging into previously had to do with that sort of gentrification of violence um, in the representation of the frontier around the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And what you can see is um, what Owen Wister, who was part of that gentrification, he was calling the Alkali Ike image of the frontier, by which he more or less meant the dime novel Western image. And at that point, you have a, a dime novelist like Fred Whitaker, who's very anti, very explicitly anti big rancher, anti the economy of the um, what was happening on the open plains and the fencing in and so on. And so the class of men, the class of white men who moved in to try to seize public opinion, um, sort of were working with popular formulas that dovetailed with formulas of conservation, anti-immigration, et cetera, et cetera. So they sort of move in and do certain things to that genre, which then subsequent dime novelists pick up on and propagate. So I, I just feel there's so many of these nodes where all these fascinating stories or kind of cultural power struggles um, get worked through. And sometimes they revolve around well, a whole lot of intersections of, of gender and class and race and indigeneity. So I think it is very, very important, as people have been saying, to remember all of that is happening in amongst all the publishers' calculations. I think I'll jump in here uh, because of mention of uh, Fred Whitaker. Um, and um, it, it does strike me that uh, to, to bring the author into the picture is, is important here as well. Uh, so we've talked um, quite a bit about publishers. We've tried to wrap our minds around what audiences wanted. Um, but I, I think that, that if we take Fred Whitaker as an example, um, who uh, has you know, something around the, the neighborhood of 70 or 80 or more, uh, dime novels to his credit written in a little more than 15 years, I think, um, that he wrote in practically every, uh, every genre of dime novel. And um, 
And it, and it feels to me like if we talk about genre of fiction of various sorts today, there's a level of specialization. You know, Louis L'Amour, what is, you know, what does he write? Well, we know <laughs> what Louis L'Amour writes, right? What does Daniel Steele write? We know what Daniel Steele writes. But um, Fred Whitaker was a generalist. And I think that in, in some ways it, it, it gets back to he's writing for this publisher that is putting out all of these different dime novels. And, and so um, if uh, it, giving a shout out to, to the Nichols and Dimes uh, Spotlight uh, selection for which I, I wrote a piece on um, Nemo, uh, King of the Tramps um, about the, among other things, uh, many other things, the railroad strikes of 1877 uh, known as the Great Uprising. Um, that that novel is a labor novel. It has a romance that has a very strong, actually feminist um, element to it. Um, it's a domestic novel about inheritance. Um, it includes some really intriguing depictions of um, uh, Romani people. Um, and, um, and it's a detective story with all, kind, all the kinds of disguises that, that go into that. And to some extent, when I see a novel like that, I can't help thinking, this is the guy who writes in all of these genres. And so if it calls for it in a particular story that he wants to tell, he can put five or six genres sort of into the same story. And he has a kind of facility with all of them that, that the specialists of genre today really don't really enjoy that freedom or maybe even that facility in all of those areas. So to, to touch again on uh, another topic that was mentioned earlier, uh, there were quite a few popular dime novel genres that really are no longer uh, extant in the same way, uh, not just railroad fiction, but things like circus fiction, fireman fiction, uh, even the sports fiction, which was huge toward the end of the dime novel era is not something that you find with its own aisle in Barnes and Noble today. Uh, so I'm curious uh, if you have any thoughts on what accounts for survival and extinction of genres, or uh, if you want to highlight a noteworthy extinct genre that might be interesting as well. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of what um, makes a specific dime novel genre um, relevant at the time and then adds long longevity uh, and, you know, throughout time uh, is, is just the characters. Um, I think that very few kind of characters resonate over time to the extent that uh, Buffalo Bill did for the Western. Um, kind of the, the central thesis of, of my work is that Texas Jack, who isn't very widely remembered uh, today, even by you know, people who know Westerns and dime novels and uh, Western American history, that Texas Jack kind of, uh, after his death, was subsumed by his profession of the cowboy, uh, that uh, he kind of formed a, a template or a, a tropic base uh, for uh, every cowboy that was going to be depicted after mainly because of his relationship with Buffalo Bill and uh, the way that that informed the, uh, Cody's view of, of cowboys. But I mean, if you looked at fireman fiction as a uh, genre you mentioned, you know, uh, Mose Humphrey, Mose the fireman did not have the longevity of Buffalo Bill Cody and very few people do. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, the, the truth is that, you know, I think that very few people could have imagined themselves as a fireman or have imagined themselves as a circus performer compared to imagining themselves, you know, riding a horse with a revolver in hand, uh, wearing a Stetson, you know, headed west into the sunset or whatever. I think that there were, and detective stories are the same way, that people liked thinking I could have solved that case or at, at the very least like watching it unfold before them. Um, so I think that it was just how much can the reader identify with the story, with the setting, uh, and mainly with the characters. Um, and I just think that was more true of, of detective stories, of Western stories, than it was of some of the uh, smaller subgenres. 
I'd like to say something about the detective stories as well, because um, not so much in, in, in terms of the question that you're answering, asking right now, because obviously detective fiction is still around. <laughs> it's, not, it's not no longer prevalent. But as far as its evolution in the dime novel world, um, you, you, you posed a question that you didn't ask about, you know, from canonical detective fiction that many students are familiar with, like Sherlock Holmes stories. And, but in many ways, a lot of this detective stories in the dime novels are very close. And we can see that there is an evolution that's going on. And they do address, you know, certain styles of the types of detective stories there are. And you can almost in, in some of the dime novel stories find those styles. The uh, spotlight that I did on Tiger Dick the Pharaoh King actually used one of the least of the five stylistic tools that you normally find in a detective story, which is the inverted murder mystery where those of us, we know who the culprit is right off the bat. And what we are following in the story is the detective, the amateur or the professional's detection of the crime in whatever way in which they're doing it. And so that's, that in, in and of itself is very interesting because that, wasn't, that was not even something that was really uh, thought about as a stylistic tool. And for Philip S. Warren to use it back when he did in the 1880s when the story was, was published, or 1875 when it's first published, it's pretty, it's pretty relevant. So I was just going to simply say, so you can find in a lot of the um, detective stories, there is an evolution and they do use the ones that do have professional detectives are like a Sherlock Holmesian sort of character, if you want to say, um, or, you know, or, and as a matter of fact, um, one of the stories is actually based on Wilkie Collins story, um, the woman in white or the, uh, uh, is it the woman in white? I think it is. I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment here. But anyway, uh, one of the stories is based where there's, you know, all of these characters who could be the suspect and who could have been the murderer. And at the end, you find out who it was. So there is, in terms of genre, I, I guess what I'm saying is I agree with you, Matt, that that Westerns and detective fiction stories probably had more of a formula to them that developed throughout the production of the stories that helped that to, to develop the genre so that by the turn of the century, then we actually had a genre. People were calling it something like that and saying, oh yeah, those are Western stories. And of course, Zane Gray helped with that too. So you have these stories that were developing over time that, we, that people could identify with and they began to associate certain authors with them. Yeah, and I just wondered, I don't know if this is, this is a kind of version of your question, um, not so much about genre that have disappeared, but genre that um, can now be um, look, looked at in, an, in other ways now, partly because of the kind of work that you and other digitization projects are doing. I was really interested last night when there was some discussion of um, non-gender conforming figures in dime novels. And that's obviously been seen as one strand and sometimes has been seen as very, I think Bill Brown said there were these sort of ver vertiginous possibilities for um, you know, cro cross-gender, non-binary, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not sure that, like it feels like the, that, that may be getting rethought now in terms of which figures actually could be um, represented in such fluid ways and which figures ultimately got straightened out as part of that process. So I think that there may be, in some of the work that um, scholars around your projects are doing, it feels to me that there are new at least new twists to genre being found, which, which may in fact turn out to be genre that we've forgotten about. I, I'll just put in here, uh, building on also what Matthew, uh, Matt, what Matthew said in his, his uh, I think, uh, apt speculation about, um, you know, uh, professional roles or identities that um, go out of out of style or out of fashion. 
that and in, in railroad fiction strikes me as just the, the the right example for this because you know it was it was a dangerous dynamic uh you know really at the top of the kind of labor ladder for those who are, are thinking of a a career to become an engineer of of a, of a powerful uh, train um and somehow um you know when we went to the electric diesels and it was like you know <laughs> driving a bus <laughs> except you can't uh, you can't turn the wheel <laughs> um suddenly it's it's much less glamorous and much less culturally central and much less you know it, it took much less uh manpower and people power to run a railroad um by the middle of the 20th century so that that clearly is a reason for it going out of fashion um, I'm also intrigued by um, one of the twists that, that I think was suggested in, in some of the, the, um, the preparation that Damien and Matthew uh, uh, fed us to think about this would be to think about the difference between the frontiersmen as depicted in the early Westerns and in the early um, uh, historical romances, all right, um, such as Seth Jones to the later fiction um, in which among other things, the outlaw appears and not just the outlaw as sort of the person on the edge of civilization, but the outlaw, the person who does, you know, what we would call criminal stuff um, strikes me as, as occurring um, at the moment when the civil war has just taken place. And it, for example, um, Jesse James is basically, of course, a, a, an unreconstructed Southerner. And the fact that he is a popular figure presented in somewhat ambiguous ways in, in the dime and, and nickel um, fiction um, suggests to me that one of the ways in which the appearance of the outlaw is significant and vigilantism becomes significant in uh, the dime novels. Um, is that there's a lot of processing going on about um, law and order, um, and 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 underlying it is a, um, a a very divisive experience as a nation where some people identify with the nation and with the the forceful assertion of law and order, and others are entirely alienated from, from that, uh, that project. And so I think that that might be one of the underlying historical uh, elements that brings about these changes within this, this arc of the development of the Western. Well, I thank you very much everyone for a lot of good insights on this. Uh, and we have now run out of time for our genre panel, so it is time to switch gears to our second panel of the night, uh, which is going to be focused on identity. And we're, we're defining this very broadly because there are a couple angles at which we can look at this, uh, both how particular groups of people are represented and portrayed and thought about within the dime novels, and also uh, groups of people who contributed to creation of dime novels. So, you know, this can be anything from the representation of particular groups in the books to things like reclaiming female authors of which there are a wealth uh, in dime novel space. So uh, as before, I'm going to introduce our panel with sort of a generic question uh, to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and their interests. And then we will uh, go in deeper from there. So I'm hoping everyone can please introduce yourselves uh, and tell us more about work you've done with representation and the dime novel. And uh, our first victim is uh, Felicia Carr. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be a victim here tonight. I'm having a little fangirl moment because I'm so excited to be here with people that are interested in the same thing I'm interested. Thank you very much for that really great discussion. My name is Felicia Carr and I'm the Assistant Dean for Communications and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at George Mason. It's a mouthful. I'm happy to be back at George Mason after earning my PhD there in cultural studies with a focus on women's popular culture in the 19th century. 
And I'm happy to share that um, when I was working on my dissertation, I was a Horatio Alger Fellow at Northern Illinois University Library, and I'm really grateful for that support, so thank you. And it's really fun to be here now when I, thinking about in the early 2000s when I had to go to the library to see anything, and now being here to celebrate this huge success that you have in digitizing everything and opening up this access. So I thank you for continuing that work and making it possible for more people to uh, learn about it. So I focused on 19th century romantic dime novels for women. And I looked at the expansion of cheap fiction and the fiction publishing business and thought about how it played a role in the emergence of new gender norms for working class women. And it started for me with a question that when I was a graduate student, someone said, why does everybody know about Horatio Alger, but nobody knows about Laura Jean Libby? And you may know Laura Jean Libby was an incredibly pro prolific author of um, romances for women. And I thought, that's a really good question. Why is that? I know that there were hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of dime novel romances printed and that they were hugely popular, that many records of readers and reformers talking about people reading them. Um, and I, we know um, the readers love them. So I started thinking about to um, kind of some of the things we were talking about earlier about cultural power struggles and str um, by extension struggles over gender roles and thinking about um, tensions between working class and middle class women around what it means to be feminine and the proper role for women. And I've come to think that the dime novel was really um, transformative for working class women, that it was um, really important for them as they explored new um, norms of what could be considered chaste behavior. Um, and so I wonder, you know, hearing you all tonight about why they didn't live on, I think, We've talked about some characters that have lived on like Buffalo Bill or Nick Carter, but there aren't any analogous characters for women. The book's really focused on one heroine who is very adventuresome, impetuous, but the ultimate aim is always that she finds her appropriate um, romantic partner and is married at the end. And they don't really lend themselves to long-term characters. Yesterday, we mentioned one, uh, My Queen, uh, where someone did try to have a female detective, but it didn't last very long. I think that didn't t resonate with readers. Um, so those characters haven't really lived on. And one thing we haven't really talked about um, is whether or not these authors make it into the canon. Um, literary critics at the time really disparaged these romances, so they didn't really have a prayer of getting into the literary canon and getting read today um, in canonical literature courses. Um, and I know in cultural studies, we don't like to talk about quality, but I do th sometimes think it's um, worth exploring a little bit because some of the writing is really awful in the romances. Some of it's very good, uh, but some of it's pretty bad. Um, anyway, to help correct that lack of memory, I've created a website called the American Women's Dime Novel Project. And I have hundreds of examples of cover art, author bios, and histories there to um, give people an opportunity to learn more about this genre. So I'll drop the link in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next, I will welcome Taylor Evans. Hey, thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I'm Taylor Evans. I uh, teach at UC Riverside, where I also got my PhD in American literature. Uh, and I was focusing on race and science fiction. I actually got into dime novels on accident. Uh, it was not by choice. They chose me. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to figure out um, how robots and race became related in early science fiction novels. So I just kept digging earlier and earlier and earlier. Uh, at the Eden Collection, the Archive of Science Fiction at uh, UC Riverside. And eventually uh, somebody turned me on to the uh, Steam Man of the Prairies. And uh, that sort of led to my, my introduction into the issue of representation in uh, dime novel literature and the development of science fiction in this sort of American popular culture uh, context, which has been largely repressed in the science fiction community. Uh, the early science fiction magazines credited Edgar Allan Poe and um, uh, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, but they didn't mention, you know, all of the Edison aids that came out uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, which seemed to have a lot more to do with the structure of science fiction stories than things like Poe uh, had to do with them. So my own work is focused on the representation of race and uh, the way that machines and uh, enslaved peoples tend to function in similar ways in texts, uh, the earliest texts, and then in later texts, that are set more in uh, present day and have more of an adventure quality. Uh, the whiteness of the main characters seem to be constructed through their relationship to machines and technology. 
uh, something that science fiction continues, but does so in a much more deracinated way. Science fiction rarely talks about, at least early science fiction, rarely talks about race in any explicit terms. Uh, and so that uh, sort of led to my interest in um, all, all issues of representation in dime novels. Uh, my spotlight focused specifically on disability because the first science fiction novel published in the United States, uh, which I think Nathaniel Williams wrote about, uh, The Steam Man of the Prairies, the main character in that story is, is disabled, which was uh, an unusual choice and was kind of unique as far as I can tell um, in terms of later stories. Uh, in the same mode. The main characters in those stories are usually not disabled, uh, but I was interested to find uh, that disabled characters tend to be represented in the same way as this first character, where they are uh, maybe physically disabled, but they're mentally uh, extraordinary. And so the mental qualities of the ability to manipulate machines, the ability to uh, tactically manipulate situations, overtakes or sort of compensates for uh, what is presented as a physical lack so that by the end they are as ideal masculine subjects as any other subjects in the field. Uh, and so that's what I'm looking at uh, right now. That's my research at the moment, just trying to figure out more about how representation and normativity are kind of related to each other in these early texts and how it persists down into a uh, present day popular culture. Thank you very much. Uh, and next up is Dan Gorman, Jr. Hello, Damian. We meet again. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Dan Gorman. I'm a history PhD student at the University of Rochester. I did my master's in history at Villanova, where I got to know some of these fine people. Um, where I went in, I, I was curious to learn about more about scanning the digital history, the back end. And I s went to visit the archive. I met Demian, Laura Bang, Michael Foyt. Um, and I asked them, what do you, you know, what kind of stuff do you work on? And they mentioned, we have all these dime novels. And I had done some work with dime novels, um, particularly The Black Avenger of the Spanish Main by Ned Buntline as an undergrad. So I thought, oh, this could be very interesting. So I helped out with digitizing some dime novels, some of the series novels by, um, what was his name? Prentice Ingraham, I believe, who was a Christian minister. And I can talk about that more later, trying to write you know, pure versions of dime novels to shape the children's, you know, if they want to read fun novels, well, why don't we write ones about, you know, biblical figures. And uh, so I helped with scanning that. Uh, I wrote a paper about Mormon stereotypes because it, it technically wasn't a dime novel. It was a little nonfiction booklet, but it's basically a dime novel because it presents the Mormons as, you know, an evil cult out to steal our virginal Protestant women. Um, and so that was pretty interesting, unpacking the history of that. And Marlena and I compared editions and figured out that, you know, either the company went under or someone stole the plates or bought the plates. But the same little pamphlet had been republished over and over and over again as Mormonism exposed. So, yeah, I'm interested in, I guess it's mostly religious stereotypes that come up. And then there's sort of that Protestant I don't know what you want to call it, miasma of, you know, <laughs> Protestant assumptions that undergird the morality in a lot of these dime novels. For my own part, because I still, you know, I'm still learning about dime novels, I'd be curious to read more of the ones in particular about LGBTQ themes. Um, because I'm curious in relation to those Protestant assumptions, someone before mentioned that some of these LGBTQ characters get straightened out by the end of the stories. And I'd be curious to see what kind of religious assumptions come to bear, you know, are they punished for their, you know, unusual behavior compared to the other characters, the heterosexual characters. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to still be explored with religion and dime novels. Thank you very much. And uh, last but definitely not least is uh, Dee Dee Johnson. Well, okay. Um, I am associate editor of Dime Novel Roundup and a retired professor of children's literature. I'm glad you expanded the definition of identity a little bit because otherwise I was thinking I didn't have a lot to say. I do look at um, portrayals of girls and women. Most of my research though is in uncovering or recovering the lives of lesser known women authors who wrote um, dime novels, um, who wrote story papers, who wrote girl series books. And my readseries.com website has some of those biographies. So a lot of my interest is, especially with the story papers, 
we know the big names, Anna Stevens, Meta Victor, but we really don't know some of the lesser people, Letty Artley Irons, Mary Grace Halpin, some of the women. And part of me just wondered what kind of women went into writing dime novels um, and story papers, why? And what autobiographical elements am I seeing? That's about it. Except I'll add Felicia, I was just rereading your dissertation and it's so marvelous. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say that we, we talk about women having the imposter syndrome. I was afraid to read this for like 10 years after I wrote it because I thought it was awful. So thank you. I came back to it uh, for this conference and thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you everyone. Um, so let's start by uh, saying dime novels sometimes reinforced and sometimes challenged contemporary views of things like race and gender. Uh, in what ways, do you think that they most significantly impacted the views of their readers, if at all? I'd start um, with romances. I think it's very, it does um, feel very specific to the genre because I know from reading many um, by uh, memoirs and histories of labor reform movement that working class women did read these romances. They talked about them all the time. They talked about them by name. They traded them, they rented them, they purchased them when they could afford it. So we know they were really voracious readers. And I think um, it must have influenced them, the, the volume that they were bringing in. It had to have some kind of impact. And I don't want to talk about causality because I can't really say that it caused something but I do know that um, they insisted that all the stories have a happy ending. Laura Jean Libby wrote one sad ending, the kind of thing where uh, the heroine transgresses and then pines away in regret. And the, her readers apparently wrote her a flood of fan mail and told her to never do that again. They wanted happy endings. They wanted stories where um, the heroines could be active, impetuous, um, a little... Um, mischievous even and getting themselves in dangerous situations, but they also wanted to be able to protect their chastity. And every story is ardent that the female character is absolutely chaste. Um, and I think that's really important for them when you think about that space they were negotiating as working women where they actually had to be out on the streets. Um, they were in a situation where they were flirting with men, they were going to dance halls, so middle-class reformers would say their character was in question. And I think these stories really kind of helped them negotiate a new mindset about what it meant to be a woman, a working class woman who could be out, could be active, out of the home, and also a respectable woman. It's interesting you say that um, because my queen, um, which is the series that I work with for my spotlights, again, there's that emphasis on Marion being so pure, but also since that's one of the few series that was targeted at young girls, it keeps showing women who are out in the working world in a variety of careers and they're out there successfully. Marion can't manage to stay in the same job because it would be too boring, but her dear friend Alma Allen is a journalist for the first half of the series. And so you're seeing the secondary character showing how successful a woman can be out in the world. Mm -hmm. I could uh, speak a little bit more to the, the sort of racial aspect of this, the idea that um, the, these novels tended to reinforce racial stereotypes, especially around uh, blackness. And what was surprising to me, I think, was how important minstrel shows, which started um, decades before even the dime novels, were to the representation of Black characters in these stories, especially the science fiction ones. Um, but, you know, pretty much every novel I've read that has a, a Black character in it, the uh, character is clearly written in dialogue, which uh, mimics the, the vaudeville theater and is drawing from extant stereotypes that had their roots in a kind of verisimilitude, but that quickly became uh, 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 stereotyped characteristics that would then sort of shape how readers were supposed to treat them. And in later iterations of these same stories and the sort of children's books in the 19, uh, early 1910s and 1920s, the, you'll see the same sort of character, even though they're treated with a kind of gravity and respect in terms of their capabilities. There's this almost ritualistic humiliation of 
uh, any black character where they will attempt to speak uh, in, in elevated language and it will fail and the white young characters will correct them. Uh, so that I think in that sense, it kind of reinforces this notion that whiteness is associated with mastery and control and blackness, even if it is uh, sort of effective in the world and has capability uh, is still associated with a kind of lack of mastery and inability to master. And so that dynamic uh, really kind of plays out in these novels across the, the ages that I've read. I've noticed that as well. I mean, to, in the Black Avenger of the Spanish main, um, I believe the he's described as Spanish, the Black Avenger, his, it's a name. He's not actually a black man, but he has a black sidekick who's a former slave who's per portrayed as basically a sort of a prehistoric sort of out of control figure and you know so the broken english these stereotypes that we see but certainly about native american characters too um including in the dime novel i wrote about for this project i think the other thing i've been thinking about is that the with the importance of having happy endings and that you know good triumphs over evil this this sort of cozy protestant morality um clearly i think clearly it, it had to have an impact because children are very impressionable but the tricky thing is, do we, and this is, perhaps Deirdre could speak to this also, do we have diaries left over of children's talking about dime novels that, you know, the lessons made an impact on them? I mean, this is, this is the challenging thing about trying to recover what children think. They rarely leave detailed records for us to use. Well, the same is true for working class women. They didn't have time to write diaries um, or letters. There's very few. I spent a lot of time looking in archives trying to find impressions of what, how they felt about the reading, and it's very difficult to find you're uh, more likely to find reformers impressions of what working class women were reading. And we know that of course they have a very strong bias against it, the value of it. So it is a challenge, but I like to think about how they, um, for at least for young women, they um, told us what they thought by the volume in which they purchased them. Because we mentioned earlier that um, the publishers experimented with genres and they pulled things very quickly. They could get rapid feedback if a title or a series didn't sell. So I think that is some indication that the young women really enjoyed these stories and found them of value or um, an important part of their emerging culture. I don't know of children talking about dime novels, but Laura Ingalls Wilder and Alice Paul both mentioned reading the New York Ledger. In fact, Alice Paul's diary, she has an entry, I got my ledger. She's so excited that she was able to get an issue to read. I'll just pick up on a comment in the chat that sometimes the letters were fabricated. I did read um, Laura Jean Libby's um, secretary left a memoir and he said that she routinely fabricated letters when she was editing one of the um, women's journals. The, the one other thing I'll mention too is that on the sort of the counter side, the, um, the dime novels that were written explicitly to, to teach good morals, the ones by Prentice Ingraham, but then also similar things, sort of, you know, the Catholic equivalents of like the New York Ledger, these, these youth magazines, um, the, the Juvenile Instructor, which publishes stories for Mormon youth starting in the early 20th century. I mean, I would assume that those would definitely shaped the worldview of people who remained active in their religion and probably also some people who later quit because they got sick of it. I'd like to say something for me, Demian, may I weigh in? Certainly. Um, I'm not challenging, uh, uh, was it Taylor? I'm not challenging you. And by the way, my husband is a, an alumni of UC Riverside. Um, I am not challenging you so much, but my experience with dime novels and the characters of color, particularly now, obviously being a detective fiction scholar, I, I focus on a lot of those, but I also see African-American or Negro characters in others. and. While yes, there are some stereotypical um, characters, there are also some very positive depictions of, as a matter of fact, you know, my guy, Phil Warren, he, in almost every story that, and he wrote 61 dime novels and almost every story that he wrote in which there was an, a, a Negro character, it was a very positive portrayal. Uh, the Three Jolly Pards comes to mind, so Tom, Dick and Harry, uh, and there are others, um, and also, uh, Sam Johnson, the Negro Detective, that was by Harry Kane in the New York Boys Library. Um, uh, Dan's Darky Dan, he wasn't, you know, it's not a terrible story about Darky Dan, I mean, but, and I would say this, 
Also, um, by the way, Dan, I think, are you meaning uh, Prentice Ingraham's dad was the minister? J.H., I'm Moral sorry, there, there were yeah. two Ingrahams. The yeah, father was, was his Reverend J.H. Ingraham. wrote the more moral stories. Prentice Ingraham was a colonel in the, from the military. I, I'm, was, I'm yeah. sorry, I get yeah, them mixed Westerns. up all the time. <laughs> but, you know, there's another story called Nicodemus, the detective from Africa, you know, and that was in Frank Leslie's Boys and Girls Weekly. So there are a number of, so I just want to say that while, yes, there are there is stereotypical, but I have to I feel inclined to have to say and speak up for those who were not necessarily victimized in the dime novel stories, but who were actually shown in a more positive light, even if they did uh, include dialect that wasn't exactly, you know, uh, on par with the way whites spoke, but they were still a positive de you know, depictions nonetheless. So I need to say that. Okay. I really, I really appreciate that. And that's actually one of the great values of this uh, conference for me is my, my experience is very limited to sort of early science fiction style texts, which um, I, I began to realize once I looked through the archives of, of this great digital collection, it's just the tiniest fraction of what's actually out there. It wasn't, it wasn't really much of a genre in the early days. Um, there was maybe only a couple of series. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited to, to look into the, the more positive depictions. I haven't found any in science fiction, but if anybody does, I would love to hear about it uh, so that I can write about it. I, I feel like I've read that the Electric Bob series has some better depictions than some of the others, but I haven't personally uh, encountered those texts, but maybe a tip. Um, and I think on this, this subject of, of positive and negative portrayals, uh, I'm curious if anyone's run across other interesting groups that have perhaps received particularly inconsistent portrayals across dime novels or, you know, I, I think we can all sort of make assumptions, but as Marlena says, there are always exceptions. I, I'm interested if anyone's run across interesting exceptions. Do you mean by uh, a specific story in which featured a character, you know, uh, that was either non-black or, <laughs> I mean, well, I, I guess I'm asking for specifics, Simeon. Like for instance, I came across one that the key character was a dwarf. You know, are you talking about things like that? Uh, that's certainly something that, that could be interesting. And, and, you know, as Taylor mentioned, the, the positive portrayal of people with disabilities is interesting. I think there are a lot of possibilities and given the, just the huge number of, uh, of stories and the fact that publishers seem to like to come up with novel heroes, I think there's, there's almost no limit to uh, the possibilities of what one could find. That's true. I was thinking about it yesterday in connection um, to the conversation we were having about the Italian characters and the Italian American characters and kind of that connection from the dime novel through to the um, contemporary stereotype of the mafioso. Um, and I, when I read that question, that's kind of what I was thinking, like are people wondering if there's um, depictions like that um, of specific groups? And I think the one thing that I found interesting in the women's dime novels is um, they're very, focused. They're laser focused. There are no other groups. Um, there's a heroine. There's a, a potential good suitor. There is a bad suitor who's um, very attractive and very difficult to discern his true intentions. And there's often a rival, a female rival. And there may be a family, but it's nothing like earlier sentimental fiction where the family was really prominent. And I've, I've been really struck by the very um, stark lack of other people. <laughs> Um, it's really intensely personal with a very limited cast of characters. There are often, there's sometimes bandits, they sometimes get abducted, but they're not really core characters. So I think it's an interesting thing that in these novels, there aren't other groups being discussed. I don't know what the significance is of that. I've just observed it. And I was thinking with this question, the Marion Marlowe number 23 that I wrote about, um, Dan mentioned the Mormons. In the train, they're talking about how they'll go to Utah and there are no Mormons in the story, but all of the standard prejudices about Mormons come out. And then of course, when they do go to Utah, things get horrific in that later now. But just the idea that the character's conversation brings up 
prejudices that were endemic to the times, even when the characters don't appear. I gather there is, however, one dime novel about a Mormon detective, which someone may have read. Really? Yes, it's an <laughs> old cap collier. This, is, this goes to Marlena's point that, you know, with such an enormous variety of texts, um, it can be hard to make, you know, the descriptions of, you know, the, the characters aren't just treated in one way or another. And this isn't exactly a dime novel, but it was a youth novel published in 1906 called The Girl Rough Riders. And this one was by the right Ingraham, Princess Ingraham, in which <laughs> it features, you know, girls on an adventure out west riding horses and near the end of it. They're, you know, they're rescued by a bunch of friendly Mormons and they get a tour of Salt Lake City and Brigham Young as sort of this Wizard of Oz jovial grandfather <laughs> figure. So again, not not uniformly negative, but then a couple of years later you get Zane Gray writing, writing Writers of the Purple Sage and it's right back to the Mormons will steal our women. <laughs> yeah, so maybe some in some cases less about depictions of certain groups and kind of those silences about them and you know thinking about whiteness and because I think about the working class readers of the time when they were from all over the world right many of them were recent immigrants greenhorns first generation um, they came from a whole bunch of different places but that weren't northern European they weren't English and so maybe it's those silences on those topics that are more important but I often wonder how those my the readers felt when they read it and they didn't see any depiction of themselves I'm, I'm an interloper speaking here, um, I know, but I, I can't help, since, since the most recent dime novel I've been focusing on is the Nemo King of the Tramps, which then becomes my favorite dime novel at the moment. Um, the, one of the subtitles is uh, the Romani Girl's Vengeance. Um, and uh, this novel is really invest heavily in positive stereotypes of Romani people, and um, including depictions of Romani language, um, as well as culture. And um, the, the depictions are stereotypical, but, but it's, it's, it's really overwhelmingly positive. And I find, I find I criticize it because it becomes a kind of um, wedge that shows, well, why can't American workers be happy being marginalized, <laughs> um, but but one of the characters that 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 title character, the Romani girl, is is the 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 best. At, she is the 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 best at disguising herself. She is the mover of the plot. She uh, frequently cross dresses in her disguises. She has a very close relationship with um, another female heroine, and in the end, they both get. Well, one of them gets their, their the, the, the upper class lady gets her guy. Um, and she, after all that she's done to get her vengeance on the man who has betrayed her, says that she still loves him and would marry <laughs> him. And, 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 and that is like, like <laughs> the students that, that talked about this novel with me in my, my seminar that I'm, I'm conducting right now in railroad literature were like, what? <laughs> what just happened? And to me, that's one of those moments where the conventional feminine submissive ending is so off that it's like, okay, just dismiss that part. Just dismiss that conventional part. The really interesting part is this woman who cross-dresses, who has a close relationship with this other more feminine um, non-cross-dressing woman. And, which, um, which title was that? Nemo, King of the Tramps, or the Romani Girl's Vengeance, a story of the Great Railroad Riots. It's the spotlight one uh, oh, that, thank that's you. on the, the Nicholson Dimes. I'm, I'm going a little bit off script here, but just in terms of thinking about representation of different groups, one thing that, that comes to mind that I think has popped up probably in everybody's areas of interest is the portrayal of mental health issues, whether that be the, the heroine's inevitable brain fever in, in a romance <laughs> or, or the, the mad killer in the detective novel. Uh, but I'm, I'm interested if anyone has any anything to say about that area, which is a, a huge can of worms, I suspect. Well, it is because there it's not just in, I mean, in, and I think everybody here could probably say you found some character in each of the 
genres that you, you tend to dwell in, you've got some character that descends into madness slowly and you begin to watch it happen and occur. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's, it's probably one of those stylistic tools also that was included uh, because it, it makes for better copy to have somebody go crazy <laughs> and then, then, then not. Um, I, certainly in my spotlight, the key character and those of you who might read it, um, Tiger Dick, the key character's name is Cecil Beaumont, not Cecil. They pronounced it Cecil back in those days, but, uh, but he descends into madness and it's, it's crazy to watch him do it. And he's just got, he gets all crazy. And he starts having all kinds of uh, you know, thoughts and because he's so guilty and consumed by his guilt that he can't deal with it. <laughs> so I see that a lot in the, some of the stories that I see is that you know, usually it's uh, the, the guilt written that, that go crazy. Or uh, like in the same story, one of the characters that dies of a brain fever at the end. Suddenly, it just suddenly comes upon her and she falls over and dies. So is that what you're talking about? <laughs> that happens a lot in the dime novels. But it's interesting in the um, women's romances, there's no character development. So I noticed in James's comment that Descent into Madness is a form of character development. There's absolutely no character development in a women's dime novel romance. There may be a few exceptions, but in general, I think that's sort of a characteristic of it. it they're very energetic and action oriented and the times um, it's very compressed. The heroine's young when she starts and she's just a little bit older when it's over. So uh, we've talked about some cases where dime novels challenge uh, their contemporary norms. Uh, the question is, do you think that this comes from some form of progressivism on the part of the author, or is this purely a quirk of storytelling, or is there no way to know? I can jump in on the, the the novels that I've examined that had disabled characters specifically. I don't know that it's a, a quirk necessarily, but I don't, also don't think it's particularly progressive. It's more of like um, almost creating a new new form of an old normativity. Uh, and so by showing this disabled character who's able to use technology as a prosthetic, it sort of reinforces the original norm. Uh, and in the uh, my the one I did for Spotlight, One Arm Alf, he is. I think he's described as seven feet tall as like a magnetic personality. Everybody is charmed by him. He's extremely strong. The fact that he's missing an arm is it's almost overcompensated for by the rest of his character description. Uh, so I feel like it's not, it's not an attempt to show that maybe disability is another way of being normal, but rather it's treated as, as something that uh, you know, is a quirk of that character, but then it has to be made up for in some way. Um, this is a relatively limited sample that I've looked at so far, though. I will point that out. I'm feeling the same way. One thing I'll take away from this conversation is I really need to broaden my reading now. It's time for me to get out of my niche and delve into some of these other really great stories. I personally, um, I'm, I think there's different definitions of progressivism, and but for me, I wouldn't say that these were progressive stories. I know from reading some of the other um, labor reformers of the time that they, it, like middle class reformers, also lamented um, that working women were reading dime novel fiction. They thought it was a waste of time. Um, they thought focusing on wealth and aristocracy was um, a, a, a waste. And so I think while they were challenging gender norms, um, I don't really think they did it with a progressive agenda. And, but I, nor do I think it's a quirk of the storytelling because it's um, so fundamental to the story um, that women are able to go through these adventures and, you know, come out the other side as chaste women. So I wouldn't call it a quirk either. I think it's more fundamental than that, but I also, I don't think it's uh, progressive. I agree. I agree. And I would go one step farther to say that in many of the stories that I have reviewed in, in, over time, what I see more, not so much as progressivism is more as social commentary. I see that, you know, an author will insert and a comment or even between dialogue between two characters mm -hmm. that will make uh, some kind of commentary about the federal, the government or, or you, know, uh, you know, whether or not they think the government is doing right by the people. 
Um, I, I won't go so far as to say that there's anything Marxist. I haven't come across a d direct you know, thing, but I, I have come across statements by characters uh, in which, and even the narrators of the stories, which in which they'll insert a little bit of commentary about what they see is happening uh, culturally and politically at the time. But I, I think it's I think it's more of a quirk than an actual attempt at showing um, pro pro progressism. You know. If if I could jump in real quick, one of the things I found in in looking at uh, the story in my spotlight specifically is that I found it was interesting to have. Um, this Native American kind of ally uh, paired with Texas Jack against uh, the Comanche Indians specifically. So it wasn't a clear cut, uh, some Indians are, are all Indians are bad. It was more of a, there are, there are Native uh, tribes which are allied with uh, white people and they're, they're safe, whereas the ones that aren't uh, are less so. Um, and to me, what I found was that uh, because Buffalo Bill either A, wrote this story outright, or B, wrote it in collaboration with Prentice Ingraham, which is, I think, more likely. But I do think that, that Cody is informing this because of his close personal relationship with Texas Jack. Uh, Texas Jack in 1872 was put in charge of the Pawnee's summer buffalo hunt. He was actually hired by the federal government um, and, and, and sent out to ensure that the Pawnee, A, a didn't have any problems with white hide hunters and B didn't have any problems with the uh, with Sioux buffalo hunters who were out at the same time but Texas Jack formed a very close relationship with the Pawnee tribe uh, in Nebraska because of that summer uh, to the point where when uh, the next year when the uh, uh, fight between the the Sioux and uh, Pawnee at Massacre Canyon happened he told newspapers that he felt very bad for what he called my tribe um, so he, he felt a very close personal relationship with them when he and Buffalo Bill split up their um, stage show, which lasted from 1872 to 1876, um, Texas Jack's partner for most of the years he, he toured as a solo act was a man named Donald McKay, who was a Warm Springs native uh, who had scouted during the Modoc War uh, in California. And so Texas Jack actually personally had, uh, if you want to call it, a, a Native American sidekick. So when Buffalo Bill goes to write this, this story of Texas Jack, it's kind of natural for him to take that little real life uh, anecdote, that fact that he had a dramatic partner and friend who was a Native American and extrapolate that into a kind of fictional entity. But then from there, it kind of becomes a, a genre trope where you, know, you can't imagine uh, the Lone Ranger without Tonto. Um, but, but I don't know whether you can you know, attribute Tonto specifically to Texas Jack's dramatic partnership with Donald McKay. But I do know that that, that, that must have informed Buffalo Bill's decision to write it that way. Um, so I do think that there are quirks of personality, both in the characters and in, in this specific case, in the real life people they're based on that uh, have the uh, unexpected result of kind of becoming uh, a, a standard in that, that uh, literature genre. Something I've thought about too is how you can have um, characters from different minority groups be protagonists, be sidekicks, and how you can have a combination of, on the one hand, things that seem really prejudicial to us today, but the author at the time may have thought they were being progressive and giving them a better treatment. I mean, the classic example of, you know, Charlie Chan, the brilliant detective, but he speaks in broken English. It's this, you know, he's an egregious stereotype by our standards today, but I, I do wonder at the time was some people probably thought, oh, what a great depiction of a, you know, a Chinese person, which would today we would find horrifying. But or, it, or to go even farther back, Uncle Tom's Cabin, anti-slavery book that was quite racist and endorsed, you know, the relocation of former slaves to Africa. So I think I find it interesting how the characters who can be held up as literary exemplars from these groups, they'll have that mixture of they're still the other but there's admirable qualities. And I just find that very interesting, that interplay. And then also trying to get into the author's head of, from their perspective, did they think they were being progressive? But then to us, they seem like they're falling short. But I, I think on that note, we have just about run out of time for panel two. So once again, thank you everyone for a, a lively and interesting conversation. And we now have uh, a bit of time for Q&A. Uh, I also want to 
uh, extend thanks to everyone who's been participating in a, a very vibrant conversation in the chat as well, which I have not been able to keep up with, but I've seen it flying by. So thanks everyone for being so engaged. Uh, and I will now uh, turn the floor over to Sada Prescott to moderate the Q&A. Hello, and I do want to reiterate uh, Damien's statement of thank you for such an excellent panel so far. So I'll start with the questions that I've managed to catch from the uh, very exciting chat uh, going on so far, but I encourage anybody else who wants to make a question or make a statement to use the raise hand function um, in the Zoom application, and I'm posting how to do so once more into the chat if that is confusing. Um, and if you wish to speak, I will definitely get to you along the way. So our first question that showed up in the chat uh, comes from a scholar of Penny Blood novels. Uh, so do the titles de generally indicating genre like Poor Mary or the love engagement of romance? Um, are, are these statements genre meaningful? I can answer that for detective fiction because almost always in the detective fiction annals, these stories do have the word detective, you know, uh, Sky, Sky Bolt Slim, the Mountie detective, or, you know, uh, like I said, uh, Black Tom, the Negro detective or whatever. So in the, in the realm of detective fiction, yes, they do identify it by having the word detective as part of the title. Although there are a number, of, a lot of stories that don't have that, but a lot of them do. I would add that, yes, that's true. And also the way they are published by the publishers give it that genre definition because they were all done in series or libraries. So um, Damien reminded me that um, Beetle and Adams weren't really prominent in the romance fiction um, component of cheap fiction, but they did publish the Waverly Library and those were all love stories. So if you picked up something from the Waverly Library, it didn't matter what the title was in a way, you knew what it was going to be once you became familiar with the different series. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the next question we have is based on a statement made by Mr. Kearns. Uh, you talked about demonizing of dime novels being similar to more recent concerns about rap music and other uh, groups of entertainments that are um, unfavorably looked upon by some groups. So given that some of these modern demonizations of entertainment genres is very racialized in nature, um, are the sense of racialized fears also true of dime novels? Or is it really just about the sex and violence? Or is it some kind of blend? I think it certainly could have, could have been a mixture because you, know, you have to remember that specifically in the Western uh, dime novels that you've got, uh, you know, you, they, they incorporated elements of other genres. There are elements of detective stuff uh, one of the, in fact, the uh, first Texas Jack story by Ned Buntline, which was uh, Texas Jack, White King of the Pawnees in uh, 1873, uh, has uh, uh, this, this whole thing where it's about French aristocracy and Texas Jack has a supposed uh, uh, heir to a, a title. And there's a group of people that are trying to keep him from that, disguising themselves as Indians and uh, setting a train off the tracks in order to uh, create a distraction. And so, you know, I think that, that was, it was less an issue of, of outright racism in that regard that people were worried about than it was that A, this idea of race mingling uh, and how that, you know, it spoke differently to the people in Boston, for instance, where, where Pomeroy was from, than it might to uh, Western men like Texas Jack when he was alive or Buffalo Bill uh, or people that were in their circle like uh, uh, Prentice Ingraham. Um, and so I think that uh, for the most part, it was about explicit violence uh, more so than the issue of race uh, that people were concerned about. 
I think they had a lot of concerns. <laughs> I've, I have a whole chapter on the um, moral reformers and their reaction to uh, dime novel fiction. And they were really worried about um, degeneration of the uh, race and did, um, degeneration of the nation through the loss of um, work. So they talk a lot about how working girls are wasting their time on romances and dancing when they should be working. They're wasting their time on fancy dress uh, for walking out when they really should be saving their money and being more industrious. So there's this constant current that um, the working classes weren't, um, were degenerating and not making their proper contributions to the greater social good. So I think there are concerns um, about that in addition to the violence, um, sort of thinking about whether or not the working classes were you know, uh, playing their proper role. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, I believe that Peter is wanting to uh, give a comment or a question. So I'm attempting to assist you in unmuting, Peter. There we go. I don't know, can you hear me? Yes. Can you all hear me? Yes. Well, I don't teach dime novels like most of you do. So I'm, my content is going to be a scot a scattered shot and a few general comments that I wish to make, if you don't mind, to what some of you said. Yes, is that OK? Go ahead. Are you OK there? Yeah, maybe yes, go for it. We were all nodding yes. Uh, First of all, uh, I do need to tell all of you that, you know, we thank Eddie LeBlanc for all this. And I know I, I, we need to go back in time for a bit. Eddie LeBlanc would have been very proud for all of you to be on this symposium. I know he would. I've spoken to him. I, I knew him. I saved his letters. We spoke on the phone. He would have been amazed to think that all of this dime novel work is a result of his scholarship. And I do want you all to keep a good place in your heart for him throughout all this. He was a fine, wonderful gentleman, and we will not see his like again. Um, also, I want you to know I have the next five years of my life free, so I want to visit Joe Raynone and catalog all of his material. If he wants me to, all he has to do is invite me and I'll come down. <laughs> also, Dennis Rogers, who with the Ellis Man, I mean, uh, he would have been amazed, I think, at all the work now that's being done with Seth Jones and um, all of the, the Beetle Dime novels. And, you know, we need to thank these people for being vanguards uh, for what we do. A couple things. Yesterday, somebody, I think it was Matt Short, uh, spoke about Sylvanus Cobb. And um, maybe we don't always know how to pronounce these people's name, but his great great niece told me a few years ago that indeed it was pronounced Sylvanus and not Sylvanus, and that the family called him Uncle Vaney. <laughs> they didn't call him Uncle Sylvanus, they called him Uncle Vaney, which I think is just a nice gesture. Also, um, you may know this, that Eddie LeBlanc insisted on pronouncing Frank Towsey's name as Frank Tuzzi. He said Frank Tuzzi as much, as long as I knew him, and Randy Cox does the same thing, but I think that Towsey is correct. I never wanted to correct these people, you know, but, uh, but they did, he did pronounce it Frank Tuzzi all of his life, but I think Frank Towsey is the, is the correct pronunciation. I do want to say to all of you a couple of things. First of all, I think it was Felicia Carr that mentioned consistent female dime novel characters. But there is a series of dime novels called Young Wild West. I think they were written by Cornelia Shea. And there is a subsidiary character called Arietta, who appears generally in those dime novels. So you might want to take a look of how Young Wild West and Arietta work together in tandem. Also in the movie Annie Oakley with Barbara Stanwyck, uh, Ned, Ned Buntline is in it. He's a cat, not played by Ned Buntline, but, but uh, he's in it. Uh, he's a character in the movie and uh, you might want to look into that. <clears throat> and also um, Fritz Lang's silent movie, The Woman in the Moon, which was, which was produced in Germany, 1928, has a character reading an American dime novel. I think it's a Nick Carter. I'm not sure, but that might be something you want to look at. It's available on Kino. I have it. It's, it's quite long, but it's interesting. 
And Dan Gorman, I think, mentioned uh, Ingraham, Prentice Ingraham. Um, his father was Joseph Holt Ingraham, you know, Color of Fire, dime novels, but spiritual dime novels based on, based on the Bible. You should know, I think, for those of you that are teaching Seth Jones, you probably have access to the Beatle version. Is that what you're mostly looking at? Those of you that know that novel, are you looking at the Beatle version? Uh, you might be aware that in 1907, it was published as a hardcover by Dillingham in New York, and that Ellis wrote a detailed preface on how it came to be. He knew Orville Victor, he knew George Monroe, and it's really just a fascinating time machine to go in the back and look at, and look at how Ellis, in his own words, how he created Seth Jones. And for those of you that like story papers, uh, especially in Boston in the mid 19th century, you need to read Martin Merivale by Trowbridge because it is a fascinating, it is a fascinating background on the authors and the publishers that most of us know about. Um, he masks all these authors with with pseudonyms, you know, with fake names. I'm sure Ned Buntline is in it. I have my own idea who he is, but it's a pen name. Uh, and we know, of course, uh, Ocean Dodge is a character in it as well because Trowbridge lets that out in his autobiography. So read Martin Maravale if you can. And I also need to make mention to all of you about this wonderful dime novel project the important thing is that you're making this accessible to us. You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I was reading Dime Novel Roundup. I was reading Randy Cox's bibliographic listings. And I'll say, oh, gosh, I would love to read that Dime Novel. I would love to read that Dime Novel. It was impossible. But now for all of you who were teaching this, all you have to do is push a button. And thanks to Damien and Matt, all you have to do is push a button and there it is. So the accessibility issue, I hope we don't take this for granted. We never should. All this work that they do is paramount to our, you know, to our academic pursuits, to our skill, and to our readership. So I hope all of you um, <laughs> continue to uh, polish their crowns because they certainly need to be polished. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for all the valuable comments. Well, I have a big mouth. Thank you. <laughs> all right. We have a couple minutes left. Uh, so the, the one of the next questions is, do any of the panelists here have favorite mash genre mashups that we haven't talked about yet? There were a couple mentioned in the chat as part of that question as well. What do they mean by mashups? Like detective science fiction, particular novels, or <laughs> um, a romance western detective science fiction railroad novels. <laughs> so combinations. I don't have a favorite uh, uh, mashup, but I have a favorite what might have been mashup. Uh, right before Texas Jack uh, passed away at the age of 33 in uh, 1880, uh, there were a couple of stories in, uh, in a couple of different newspapers that uh, Bracebridge Hemming had approached him to write uh, a, a brand new Texas Jack play for his next dramatic season, uh, and that they had made some progress on this, and it was all going to happen, and then uh, you were going to have a season of, uh, you know, the guy that wrote the uh, Jack Harkaway novels, having written this play for Texas Jack um, so that Texas Jack could, uh, he, had, he had already tried uh, acting as um, uh, the character Muhammad in the play, The French Spy. He was branching out just a little bit from playing Texas Jack. Um, and I think this was his plan before, right before he died was to uh, stop just acting as Texas Jack in, in Western scout border dramas and uh, do some, actual dramatic acting in a play of his own, uh, but unfortunately never got the chance. But that's my favorite what might have been. This isn't exactly a mashup, but it's sort of, I guess what you'd call intertextuality or illusions. 
in the Black Avenger of the Spanish Main at the end of it, after this years long naval campaign against the governor of who's, who's wronged him, the Black Avenger just sort of stops the violence and stages a play, a pantomime in which he reenacts um, all of the misdeeds done by the governor. This is lifted from the, the, the centerpiece of Hamlet when Hamlet stages the play telling his uncle, I know you killed my father. Except instead of it then leading to more death, this time the governor begs forgiveness and, you know, you get the, the d double marriage scene. And I just, I remember when I read that for the first time and saying, you know, this is pulp literature, but it's incorporating, you know, a Shakespearean plot device into the structure. And, you know, I remember something Frederick Starks talked about in the past, how, you know, nautical dime novels are, you know, riffing on Herman Melville and vice versa. And I've always impressed by that there's not a strict division between high and low culture. There's that middle brow where they connect in between. Oh, you raise a really good point about middle brow and uh, culture and high culture, because I think what's interesting is with the women's romances, um, they, I think they actually kind of morph through time and they start to be read by middle-class women because you, first you have the really cheap publications, but later you get these sort of faux hardbounds and they were much more expensive. So I assume they're for a middle-class audience. So um, maybe there's a little, there's a bit of audience um, transmission as the um, concept of what's okay reading changes over time. Yeah, no, I don't have any mashups. I, I should just throw in my usual plug for uh, The Bride of the Tomb by uh, <laughs> Mrs. Alex McVeigh Miller, which is kind of a, a romance mystery gothic bit of chaos that if you haven't read it, it's, it's well worth a look. My favorite is, uh, and obviously because I, Phil Warren is my dime novel writer that I specialize in, but my favorite story by him is, is Who Was Guilty? And, and I said earlier, and I misspoke when I said it was Wilkie Collins, but it was, it's, it's based on the Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, not the woman in white. And it's a wonderful story because you, you have all of these characters. There's nine suspects and you have to go through the whole story to figure out who it was. The first time I read it, I got it about the fifth chapter. I figured out who it was. And that was better than some of the other people that I knew who couldn't figure it out, including my husband. So I just thought it's a great story. And if you ever want to read something that was, you know, it was a well-written story, probably one of the few diamond novels in that, in that genre that are very well done. So I highly plug it. It's Who Was Guilty? I also note that many of uh, the, the stories that I call science fiction that some people are starting to call science fiction um, were, were Westerns, really, or at least their, their genre that we now kind of recognize as science fiction was in itself a kind of mashup between different, different texts. Uh, and it was really only, I think, about 1993 when they began to be claimed within the science fiction community as science fiction, when John Clute uh, called them um, uh, Edison Aids or Edison Odds. Uh, so it's not quite a, a mashup, but to call them science fiction is almost to impose a genre on something that was mixing genres or kind of spinning off a, a new genre out of it. Taylor, do you find that uh, that a lot of what was the early science fiction that was set in the West morphed into what later and kind of more recently became the weird West genre? <laughs> it's, I, it's, it's a weird mix. I think uh, when we return to the West, that's where a lot of the weird West came from. It was almost like you had to go, go away from it and come back. But the, there's a real straight line from, you know, um, uh, science fiction Westerns to Star Trek and even Star Wars, which are these huge popular culture, visual culture, uh, but still sort of serial popular culture, which are very much rooted in Western tropes, uh, sometimes self-consciously so, other times just a little bit influenced. And that is now the basis for most science fiction today. So it's kind of two steps removed. But Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that because one of the things I hit on in my book is that, you know, the reason that Texas Jack and Buffalo Bill were so successful as kind of pop culture stars was because of the way that they stood in, in regards to the border and the frontier. Uh, and that essentially once that switched over in, from being a Western focus to a science fiction focus, the stories didn't change. It was just which frontier you were talking about, the final frontier or the, the Western frontier, um, which is why I think it's interesting today, not to get too far off topic, that you have shows like The Mandalorian, which is a very kind of clear serialized 50s style Western 
set in the Star Wars universe. But I think that that that, that kind of blending of, of what would have been dime novel genres is still going on in that kind of pop culture. There's an international component there I just want to mention, and I will try to tie this back to dime novels briefly. The Mandalorian is escorting it escorting a little child to safety. There's a long running Japanese comic series called Lone Wolf and Cub about a samurai who's escorted, you know, with his son. It, it's riffing on that image. And so that's a case of Japanese media being translated into American media. I would be curious in this vast corpus of dime novels are, you know, someone would ask before in the chat about dime novels translated into other languages. Penny presses abroad, you know, what's being stolen or stolen, lifted from there and being incorporated into American stories. I mean, these are the questions we can explore now with this enormous collection you guys have placed online. Thank you very much. Um, the last question that we'll probably have time for is, I'll, I'll try and combine a couple of questions um, about authorship. Um, how do you see the function of uh, bylines as brand and um, like celebrities and how do you sort of track uh, more verifiable authorship? How do you consider it conceptually? Uh, yeah, that, that really kind of comes up in mind because like I said before, I, I don't believe that Buffalo Bill ever 100% by himself wrote a dime novel. He's credited with a number of them, but there is a good chance that he wrote them with other people. Specifically, um, I believe that uh, John Burke, who was his uh, kind of uh, promotions manager, uh, assisted with a number of them. And I also believe that most of them were either written or co-written uh, by uh, Prentice Ingraham who also worked with Buffalo Bill Cody and his Wild West show. Um, so yeah, being able to say with any specificity, this is the author of this story at that time is tough because these guys, Ned Buntline was famous for using uh, pseudonyms, not just because he didn't want people to know what he'd written, but because he would have signed an exclusive contract with one publisher, but wanted money from a second publisher. Um, you can tell a lot, especially, and that's one of the benefits of an archive like this, is uh, doing some of the um, kind of text analysis, uh, which is one of the ways I know that, uh, that Texas Jack probably didn't write um, the one attributed story to him. But I also can verify because of other archives, like newspaper archives, that right before that story was published, um, which was Ned Wilde, the Boy Scout, uh, right before that story was published, Texas Jack makes a stop in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, uh, specifically to visit Prentice Ingraham. Um, you know, so the, the combination of these archives allows us to make some inferences that we wouldn't have otherwise. Certainly, too. The Street and Smith archives actually show the authors behind certain dime novels. They list um, who wrote them. So mm -hmm. There we have documentation, um, the ones at Syracuse, but that's um, fairly limited and not for everything. And a lot of the early dime novel collectors, you know, have the lists and you can certainly see them because they're published in earlier editions of uh, issues of dime novel roundup. You have the w William H. Benner's list. You have the Ralph Bottomari list. You have the, uh, the Smith's list. There's in numerous different lists of of people who were reading these dime novels who attribute um, uh, even Frank O'Brien, the dentist who collected them, he had a list of, 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 of pseudonyms. So it is very mm -hmm. difficult to absolutely ascribe authorship. But I think if you do a combination as I have looked at these lists, you can pretty much figure out who was writing what. And many of them had as many as 10 different uh, pseudonyms. So. You know, I think if you're looking to attribute something, then you just have to go with the flow of what is on the actual dime novel and, and then look, it's a place like maybe Randy Cox's dime novel companion to see what other uh, names uh, some of the authors may have used. I also think it's a marketing, I think I heard something about marketing in that question because there were some cases like Laura Jean Libby who definitely wrote everything um, under 
her, um, under her name. There are others like Geraldine Fleming that was a house name for Street and Smith and multiple people wrote under that name, but I think they used it because readers recognize it. So it did become a marketing um, uh, tactic for them because that was something consistent and they could really crank them out. But um, you know from those archives that multiple people were writing it. But then the inverse happens too with someone like Meta Victor who writes all different kinds of fiction and publishes under like a dozen pen names to appear to be multiple different people. Um, I think to sort of fill up the pages perhaps and appear to have more variety than there really is. So from a marketing perspective, there's a variety of different tactics being deployed. I had just wanted to add um, with the mention of the Street and Smith archives at Syracuse, one of the exercises I did was track Rough Rider Weekly, which was written by, I think, four different men. And it was very interesting watching how they um, maintained individual style within this um, you know, collective name that they were writing under. And so it was almost like you could see um, a very modern sort of navigation between celebrity authorship and um, hired authorship. So the, I, the comment that was just made about looking closely at the dime novels, I think that there are forms of authorship that are legible in them, that are quite um, subtle and very illuminating. One of the thing that, one last thing that should be mentioned too, is that a lot of the dime novel authors wrote for different uh, publishers. Uh, which was not necessarily something that was, you know, like the Beetle and Adams guys, you know, some of them went over to writing for, and, and, and I was gonna, based on Peter's comment, Randy Cox and I have many times had this discussion and we call him Frank Towsey too. <laughs> but anyway, but, but, you know, they wrote, a, if they wrote for a different publisher so as not to let the primary publisher they were writing for know it, they wrote under a pseudonym. And we've di we've identified that 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 because some of the uh, publishers were you know they like like you know I'm sure uh, movie studios today that only want certain actors uh, producing films for them well the publishers were about the same way back then so I thought I that just needs to be added so it was not necessarily that they wanted to have a pseudonym but by necessity if they wanted to write and get paid by another publisher they had to adopt one. All right, thank you so much. I'll allow one last moment for anybody to uh, write any frantic questions or raise a hand, last call, as we are 15 minutes past our assigned time. Since I don't see anyone frantically typing, I will simply say thank you very much and turn it back over to Matt and Damien for our wrap up. Yes, thank you very much to everyone uh, who participated both yesterday and today. Uh, this has been absolutely wonderful and I'm, I'm very happy we were able to make this come together after the uh, original event in March was, was not able to go forward, but it's, it's been great to have this larger scale event. I think more people have been able to participate in this than would have been in the original plan. So, Perhaps it has all worked out for the best. Uh, and also will, as we noted at the very beginning uh, on our intro slide, yesterday's uh, talk is already up on YouTube. So if you missed the conversation, you can catch up and we'll be posting this one as well. So uh, future scholars can enjoy this night uh, indefinitely. Thank you so much for putting it together. Yes, thank you so a much. Huge round of applause. This is the greatest Zoom chat I've ever seen. Yeah, really amazing. Thank Good you. To see you, Dan. <laughs> you too. Well, unless uh, Matt has any final words, I think we can uh, wrap it up and say goodnight. Stay tuned for some video lectures coming up over the next month or two. So we'll start putting in those up soon. And as a very last note, if there are any members of this Zoom call who are 
pursuing continuing education credits for K through 12 instructors. I'll be sticking around for a little bit if you need any assistance in understanding how to sign up for access or use the Moodle or for any questions you might have about getting those credits. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Good night. Have a nice evening. Good night all. Let's see if we know who the president is yet. <laughs> no, not yet. Good night. <laughs> Give it a